Hey, thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're both challenged and encouraged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithishere.org right after this video. Let's stand together, Mark chapter five, Mark chapter five. We are in a series entitled, We Are Faith. Let's say that together. We are faith. That little weak. I don't know that you know all that that entails. Now let's say it one more time with a little more enthusiasm. We are faith. There you go, that's cool. Now, and it's more than just a name. Our, Our church name is Faith Assembly of God, but it's more than just a name of a church we have got to be men and women of faith. Because it says in Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please God and we wanna be God pleasers. And so we've been looking at some incredible stories from the word of God and we'll be looking at another faith story this morning. So let's look together, Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter five, excuse me, Mark five and verse number 21. And when Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of a large lake, uh, of a lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my daughter is dying, please come, put your hands on her so she will be healed and lived. And so Jesus went with him. Father, today as we open up your word, open up our hearts, may we receive exactly what you have for us today. I pray that you will build faith in the congregation. I pray this morning that at the end of this service we will see men and women healed, lives restored, lives changed by the power of your word. And we love you, God, and we ask all this in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Turn to someone, tell them they look great today, and then you may be seated. How many in the house have children? Let me see your hand. Okay, most of you. If you've had a child that's been seriously ill, you can identify with Jairus today. A a story about a man whose baby girl, whose little daughter is sick. Maybe you've heard the report from the doctor, we're doing all we can, but things don't look good. Doesn't look great. I, I don't have real good news I can share with you. And when you encounter a time like that in your own life, it doesn't matter if you are someone special or someone great or you've got all kinds of clout at your business or your job or you are just an average Joe, all you can think about is the health of your son or your daughter, your child. That's all that matters. Everything else kind of begins to become very insignificant. And, and when, you, when the doctor says, we don't know what we can do, there's nothing left to do, We've done everything we can. There's there's really no hope for your little girl. There's no hope for your little boy. You will never feel more helpless or more inadequate than at that time in your life. And this is where we find Jairus at today. He is going through that very same thing right now in his own life. He is a very desperate man. Now, as we've been studying these stories together, I think the one common theme besides the faith they have is their desperation. Every story is about someone who has been very desperate in need of God. We looked at the father of the demon-possessed boy, and his boy kept throwing himself into the fire, trying to kill himself, trying to take his own life, and, and he was desperate for God, and he cries out to God, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Somehow help me to believe, help me to trust in you. And then we looked at the story of the centurion soldier who had a servant who was dying and and he has incredible faith and he says, just say the word and my servant will be made well. Just say the word. He understood the power of the word of God and spiritual authority. And then we saw the blind Bartimaeus 
and he's sitting beside the road at Jericho, and Jesus Christ is passing by, and it may be the only time he's ever going to go, it's the only time he will ever go through that city again, and, and he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the more the cro- crowd tried to shut him out, the louder he cried out. He was desperate for his healing, desperate for God. And then we saw about the Canaanite woman who had a demon-possessed girl. And when Jesus tried to maybe put her off and say, I've come to the house of Israel, he said, oh, but, but even, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. The crumbs of your grace, the crumbs of your healing power will be enough. If you'll just let me have the overflow of your grace, my daughter will be okay. What a great story. Desperate people crying out for God, looking for God. And today we're actually going to see two stories that intersect, that meet together of two very desperate people and how they encounter God. And so let's get some lessons from this this morning. I've got three powerful lessons that I want to share with you. And the first is this. Learn to run to Jesus when the bad news comes. I think this is a theme you see throughout all five stories and the two today. Learn to run to Jesus. When your bad news comes, look if you would at verses 22 and 23 again. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. You can imagine Jairus watching his daughter. She is the apple of his eye. Daddy's little girl. How many, how many men have girls? You know how special that little girl is. But her breathing's getting more and more labored. Her skin is flushed with fever. Her lips are cracked and dry. She hasn't eaten anything for two days. And now all she does is just sip a little bit of water that they try to give her. She's only 12 years old. The best physicians in the city of Capernaum said, you know what, we don't know what's going on. We don't understand why this is happening, but it doesn't look good. She's getting worse by the minute. And and he sees this, and and all of a sudden, this this Jairus, his heart is flooded with fear. What am I going to do? Where can I turn? What, What can I look? Where can I get the answers? Now, the Bible tells us Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. And so to be a ruler of the synagogue in the city of Capernaum means he's a man of importance. He is the ruler, he's the top guy, he is a guy who is used to getting things done, but now at this time in his life he feels so helpless and so hopeless, and what can I do? And though he is a religious man, he is tempted to get angry at God. God, why me? Why are you letting this happen to my only daughter? Why why is this going on? What, What did she ever do? She's so innocent, why is she suffering like she's suffering? But all of a sudden, he knew what to do. I must go find Jesus. And so he goes and he seeks out and he begins to look for Jesus. And and he knew that he hung around with some fishermen. And so he goes by the Sea of Galilee. And there he would find the Lord Jesus Christ and a crowd who had been gathering around. And, And as he goes to find Jesus, he says, I only hope he can heal my daughter. I only hope he has the answer. I only hope I haven't waited too long to get there. But he seeks Jesus Christ out. And the Bible says when he arrives there, immediately he falls at his feet and says, Jesus, if you'll just come, my daughter can be made whole. Listen, it doesn't matter what position you may hold in life, there's going to be a day when you receive some bad news. You're all going to get it. I have got news for you. The bad news is going to come at some time or some point in your life. And if you don't have an ongoing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to reach out to something for an answer. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you may reach out to a bottle for your answer. And that's what the world would do. If I can just find a bottle, if I can just drown my sorrows, then I'm going to be okay. Maybe it's a a bottle of pills you'll seek out or some other kind of drug to ease your pain. Maybe you'll look for your comfort in the arms of somebody else. But instead of comfort, what happens is it only gets worse. We only compound the problems because you won't find the answer in this world. But the Lord is the light of my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
and I can run into his arms and there I can find peace and I can find healing and I can find hope for my situation. (coughs) When you find yourself in that kind of situation, when you get bad news, you can also run to your church. Isn't it good to know that you can find Christian brothers and sisters at your faith family who will pray for you, who will lift you up before the throne of grace? And we know that ultimately only Jesus Christ is the healer, but it's good to have several people praying with you, encouraging you, saying, you can make it, don't give up, we're right beside you every single step of the way. What a wonderful to have a church family that we can turn to in our time of need. And we seek out the Lord Like Jairus, we fall at his feet. Say, God, I need help. He knew where to run to. He knew where to turn. He knew who to fall down before, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Isn't that a great verse? I'm going to read it to you again. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Now, how do we do that? How do we practically cast our cares on the Lord Jesus Christ? How do we fall at his feet? How, how, how do we find his sustaining strength in our time of need? We seek the Lord through prayer and through worship. When you find yourself in a need, the first thing we need to begin to do is pray. Now, it ought to come out of a relationship that I've already been praying. I'm already in communion with the Lord. I'm already talking to him every day. But I want to tell you, he invites you when you have a problem, when you have a situation. We can come, to, the, as the Word of God says, to the throne of grace. And there we will find grace and mercy to help in our time of need. So just like Jairus came and he runs to Jesus Christ and he falls at his feet, when we have that crisis that hits our life, I want to challenge you, fall at the feet of the Lord in prayer and seek his face and worship the Lord and God will hear. He hears every prayer that you pray. Miracles occur. And I want to tell you, even if that miracle that you're looking for may not happen right away, it's as you go to the Lord in prayer, he will give you comfort in the storm. He'll give you peace in the storm. Uh, he will go with you and give you strength to make it fo- to move forward and keep on going in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray. Seek the Lord. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Great verse of Scripture. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the God of peace, which transcends all understanding, it goes beyond what we could imagine, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a great scripture. What a great promise in the word of God. So when I need that miracle in my life, when that crisis does come, and it will come, I can go to the Lord in prayer. And God will give me a peace in my heart that everything's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. He guards my heart and he guards my mind. When Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus Christ and he cries out, Lord, help me, do something. My, my daughter's dying. you got to come quick. It says in verse 24, so Jesus went with him. And I want to tell you, when you fall at the feet of Jesus Christ, he will go with you. He'll be beside you every step of the way. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He will go with you. And when, when, when Jesus said, started to move out with Jairus, you can just imagine hope begins to well up inside of him. All right, my daughter's going to be okay. Jesus is coming along. She's going to make it. If we can just get to the house, if we can just make it in time, she's going to be okay. The miracle workers come into my house. So they begin to move out. There's a couple problems though. One is there's an incredible crowd surrounding Jesus Christ. And and have you ever tried to move quickly with the crowd? A crowd has a mind of its own. 
And as fast as you may want to go and as fast as you may want to get there and as desperate as you are, the crowd just kind of drags along the way. And I can imagine Jairus' mind, okay, Lord, let's get going. She's dying. She doesn't have long. I don't know if she's going to make it. we got to hustle. But the crowd just kind of just keeps meandering along. And Jesus is walking along, and they're making their way back to his house. And then all of a sudden, with this crowd pressing all around him, uh, Jesus does something. He stops right there. And Jairus is getting more anxious. Come on, Lord. Time's running out. Let's go. Let's get there. And he stops. And then he makes this incredible statement that doesn't make any sense at all to any of the disciples, anybody standing around. He says, who touched me? Now, there's been a whole crowd pressing around him. There has been everybody pushing in upon Jesus Christ, shoving all around, meandering along, a large crowd, the Word of God says. The Word says they are pressing in upon him. And right in the middle of that, he makes a statement, who touched me? And the disciples say, wait a minute, time out, the Lord. What do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. They're all around you. They're all pressing up against you. But Jesus knew something. He said, this touch is different. He felt a surge of healing power go out of him. The healing virtue has left me. It went out of me. Something different, something unusual has just happened. I have no idea what that must have felt like. There was a surge of power that went out of Jesus Christ. Now, All this is going on, and Jairus is probably almost panicking by now. He's saying, Lord, what's going on? Why are you stopping? We don't have much time. The last image that is flashing through his mind is the image of his wife bending over his daughter's almost lifeless body, crying and weeping and saying, what shall we do? What can we do? And, And so those images are being replayed in his mind, and now Jesus Christ stops. He doesn't go any further. He says, who, who touched me? And tears begin to fill his eyes. I wonder if it's too late. Now, who is this interrupter that touched Jesus Christ? Go back to Mark chapter 5. I want to pick our story up right there. Mark chapter 5 again in verse 25. Let's start with 24. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she only got worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing that what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told her, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, it's, it's interesting. When this lady is first diagnosed with her issue of blood, with her hemorrhaging, it was the same time that Jairus' daughter was being born. Right? Jairus' daughter is 12 years old. The Bible is very clear. He's, he's, he's going to draw you in again with the story. He's very clear to say this lady has suffered with this ailment, this disease, for 12 years long as Jairus' daughter had been on the earth. Twelve years she'd been a slave. The movie came out, Twelve Years a Slave. Could have, been, could have been about this lady with the issue of blood because twice it says she was freed from her infirmity. So she has been bound. She has been a slave to her ailment. Uh, you say, why do we call her a slave? Well, the hardest part of hemorrhaging or bleeding like that is the segregation this lady would have to go through. So for the last 12 years, she has now been totally ostracized because according to the law of Moses, she is declared unclean. Bleeding would render a person unclean, and anybody else she came into contact with or touched, listen to that, 
touched would also be unclean. Okay? She could never enter the temple, never go into the synagogue of Capernaum to worship the Lord. Why? Because she's unclean. Unclean. Separated. She could never have intimacy with her husband. Why? Because scripturally she was unclean. She was hemorrhaging. She was bleeding. Sex was totally forbidden. In fact, the rabbis in that day and age would say, if that's the case, you are free to divorce your wife. And so in all likelihood, this lady has now been divorced. There's nobody to take care of her. And when you begin to study her medical history, she had spent all she had on the doctors. And so there's no presence of a man in her life whatsoever. So she's probably been divorced somewhere along the line. So she is weakened by her chronic anemia. She's also battled depression. And she's battled loneliness uh, and, and, and all this. And the rabbis on top of it also said she was in that condition because of her sin. Can you imagine all your life? You have this disease, you have this ailment of bleeding, and now the, the rabbis say, it's your fault. Sin must be in your life somewhere, somehow, for you to have this kind of condition. And so all this is going on, and so she too is a very desperate lady. She has totally lost all hope, but when she heard Jesus Christ was coming, something began to leap inside of her. If I can just touch, and it says in the King James, the hem of his garment, now, I want to tell you something here. This is very, very significant. The hem of his garment, what is she talking about? She is talking about what the rabbis wore, the tallit or the prayer shawl. And so all rabbis would wear a prayer shawl over their shoulders. It would run down, and there would be tassels in the bottom of their garments. Now, follow me here. The word for that is kanaf. It's the word for the hem of the garment. It is the same word for the word wings. Wings. Wings, him, same word in the languages. Malachi had prophesied that there would be a Messiah who would come with healing in his wings. Messiah is going to come. He is going to rise up. He is going to rise up with healing in his wings. If I can just touch the wings, the hem of his garment, he is the Messiah. He will rise up. I will be made whole. Hallelujah. I, I used to think, and when I heard this story as a, as a child, I used to think this lady was just so weak, she just fell over, and all she could grab was the hem of his garments. No, that's not the way it happened. She is very intentional in her approach to Jesus Christ. She is going for the hem of his garment. She's going uh, for the wings. Uh, that's the part she is going to reach out. That's the part she is going to touch. Why? Because Messiah is going to rise up with healing uh, in his wings. Uh, what a lady of faith. Faith. That's faith. If I can just get to Jesus, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Faith in the word of God. Hallelujah. And in that moment, she was healed. And every trace of the illness is gone. And vitality begins to flow in her veins, in her muscles, in her body once again. Uh, the weakness, the exhaustion has now vanished because she's come in contact with Jesus. Now Jairus has witnessed this miracle. He sees it with his own eyes. And, and I can imagine on the one hand, he's getting kind of excited. If Jesus can just heal this lady with just her touching the hem of his garments, just think what's going to happen when he touches my daughter. She's going to be made whole. She's going to rise up. She's going to be strong again. She's going to be healed. Uh, surely he can heal my daughter. But we got to hurry. Time is running out. We've had delays along the way. It's taken forever to get there. We've got to hurry. And then he turns around and he gets some more news. Now, I want us to move to the second lesson, and it's simply this. Learn to rejoice when others are blessed. This is good for everybody in the house today. Listen to me. Learn to rejoice when others are blessed. Romans 12, 15 puts it this way. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Now, let me tell you something about rejoicing with somebody else. When you hear good news and you're doing well, 
you rejoice. That's great, man. Someone tells you about how God healed them. Someone tells you how God restored their marriage. Uh, someone tells you how God blessed them financially. Someone begins to share some good news with you. And as long as you're doing fine, what do you do? Man, that's wonderful, buddy. I'm happy for you. But what happens when someone tells you that very same news and you've just lost your job and you're sicker than a dog and you can't get out of bed? That news doesn't seem so great. In fact, doesn't the reverse sometimes happen in our mind? God, why won't you do that for me? Why am I being left out of the blessing? Why am I being left out of your healing power? Why, why not me? And it's at this moment Jairus turns, and in verse 35, the Bible says he gets the news, your daughter is dead. Can you imagine all the thoughts that are going through his mind at this time? Just a few moments ago, Jesus is coming to my house, and he's going to fix everything, and he's going to heal my baby girl. But now they say, your daughter is dead, and they make another statement, don't bother him anymore. Wow. Don't bother him anymore. It's, it's really too late. Hope is gone. She's dead. I I'm begin, I, I can imagine he begins to play mind games. How many ever played your own mind, the what-if game? We all play the what-if game. As soon as something tragic happens, we play the, the what-if game in our mind. What if I'd just gone earlier? What if I didn't wait so long? What if I just sought Jesus out a, a day earlier? Everything would be okay. What if the crowd hadn't been so slow? What if they just moved a little bit faster, guys? Why didn't you just pick up the pace? What if this lady hadn't held us up so long? We could have been there by now if this lady had only not stopped by. What if? How many have had days where you think things have been working out and things are going great and you're heading in the right direction and Jesus is walking with you and bam, the whole bottom drops out. And you play all those what-if games in your own mind, and you, you, you're going through the, all these emotions, and, and you thought you were going to get a job, but the, the, they come along and tell you, you know what, I'm sorry, but somebody else just kind of eked you out. You were second in line. You were close. Uh, you didn't quite get it. You were almost there, but someone else got in front of you. The doctor calls, and he says, you know what, I got some news for you. Your cancer that we thought was in remission, it's gotten worse, and now it's spread throughout your body. You thought you were beginning to communicate with your spouse and you thought maybe things are picking up a little bit in the marriage and, and things are going to get better now, but all of a sudden you open the mailbox and there's a divorce paper from the attorney. You believe you're going to be healed. You believe things are going to work out. You believe restoration is going to come, but you get the bad news. And when that bad news hits you like a ton of bricks, all of a sudden the finality sets in and you think, don't bother Jesus anymore. It's just too late. It's too late. Jairus is heading with Jesus for his miracle, and someone else cut in line. Someone else got in the way. And now she's healed, and my daughter's dead. What's fair about that? She cut in line. How many have been to Disney World? You wait for hours to ride. It's a small world after all, and a whole crowd of guys come up and just kind of cut in line right in front of you. What do you want to do? You want to wring their neck out. You want to yell, hey, buddy, get in the back in line. And he's heading for his miracle, and somebody cut in line. Somebody took my miracle away from me. It's possible to be so consumed with your own problems that when others receive their blessing, we get bitter. Am I only talking to me here? I, 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 right? Human emotions, why not me? Listen to me, don't let someone else's testimony discourage you in your pursuit of God. But every testimony you hear ought to encourage you to press in further and say, God, yes, if you did it for them, you can do it for me. Uh, yes, I will not give up. I've heard their story. I, I've seen what you can do. He got so low, they said, don't bother the Lord now. And you begin to think in your mind, God's got healing for everybody else. God's got restoration for everybody else. He's got freedom and blessing for everybody else, but it's too late for me. 
But if you'll listen to their story, listen to their testimony, and rejoice and thank the Lord with them, if he did it for them, he can do it for me. That's the power of the testimony to build up your faith. Don't let it make you bitter. Let it increase your own faith. And so Jesus says to him in verse 36, don't fear, just believe. Don't fear, just believe. Maybe he said, as he said, don't fear, just believe. He kind of looked over at that lady and said, Jairus, see her? See what happened to her? You don't fear, just believe. Faith builds, testimonies build your faith. They are meant to be faith builders. If he did it for him, he can do it for me. Revelation 12, 11, listen to this. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. It builds up faith. It builds up overcoming, victorious, powerful faith. Now, I, I've got some wonderful news for you. For you guys that have been in a cave somewhere, God is doing the miraculous at Faith Assembly of God. There are so many incredible testimonies all around this house today. Everybody look around. Look around. Just look at your neighbor. Look around. Look behind you. Look in front of you. These are testimonies of God's incredible grace. God is alive and well. There are testimonies all across this auditorium of his healing power. I heard one this, this week. Uh, a good buddy of mine called me up. says, you know what? They said, uh, I've got cirrhosis of the liver, and uh, if it's not that, it may be cancer, and the church is praying, and his wife's praying, and he's praying. They come in a, a day later and say, you know what? We can't find anything. You're okay. Just get out of here. Just go home. Listen, God is still healing today. He does it all the time, right? All the time, God is healing, touching, doing miracles, restoring Restoring marriages, blessing his people. We, we've been featuring a video testimony every week. We're going to have another one in just a moment. You have a book that you're going to get in your hand. If you, how, many, how many started your book this week? Let me, what, aren't, those, aren't those incredible stories? Didn't your faith just soar as you read these stories of people who encounter God in dramatic ways? If you haven't read yours, you got another week. If you didn't get, weren't here last week and couldn't make it, you, we got more books. Uh, we only ask you to take one per family, and if you take it, read it. Okay, that's, that's the only thing we ask you to do. Otherwise, we're just going to give it to you. It's yours to keep. When you're done reading it, I would encourage you to give it to somebody else. Pass it on to a friend. Pass it on to somebody else. But everybody, we want to have that book and be able to read that. Incredible stories of God's redemption, God's healing, God restoring marriages, God setting the captive free, just incredible stories all around. And every story is meant to build up our faith. This morning we got a testimony of a lady whose marriage was hopeless. And then they turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. Take a look. Hi, my name is Mendy Yeager, and my husband and I attend the North Campus of Faith Assembly, and I'm going to tell you the story of how God saved my marriage. So the first time I ever came to Faith Assembly was five years ago, when my boyfriend at the time brought me, and up until that point, God wasn't really a priority in my life. Um, my boyfriend and I had a whirlwind romance, and very quickly we were we fell in love and uh, we were married and expecting a baby within one year of meeting each other. So it all happened very fast. Almost from the get-go, our marriage was doomed to fail because Christ wasn't the center of our home. Um, right after we got married, we started arguing more and more and we rarely got along. Uh, the situation at home just became desperate and the whole environment was just a toxic toxic environment. We knew we needed help and out of desperation and our own strength we tried everything. We tried secular counseling, we tried seeing a therapist, we saw, tried um, psychiatrists, even prescription medication, reading different books, going to seminars, and nothing stuck. Nothing seemed to work. Um, all these things were just band-aids for the real problem. Soon we had lost all hope for our marriage and we separated. All we did was exchange uh, 
fight our fights at home for now fighting battles in the courtroom. Things went on like that for a little while and then um, Pastor Ken and his wife Sue Hill actually reached out to me and they were the first people that actually spoke life into my hopelessness. I latched on to that hope with both hands and I didn't let go and that's when I began to develop a sincere and personal relationship with the Lord. And right in the middle of the divorce battle, the Lord just changed both of us um, in unique and, and authentic ways. Uh, my husband and I both rededicated ourselves to the Lord and we've never looked back. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Testimony. Now listen, that is to build your faith. And if your marriage is heading in the same direction, let her story be yours. Let it become yours. God can heal your marriage. God can put you guys back together again. There's a third lesson, and it's simply this. Learn to believe when others say to quit. Learn to believe when everybody else says quit. And I want you to pick up the story in verse number 36. Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. And they laughed at him after he put them all out. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went into where the child was, and he took her by the hand and said, Talitha Kuma, which simply means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the little girl stood up, walked around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. Incredible story. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Here's, here's what's going to happen. When you begin to step out in faith, you're radical for the Lord. You're going after God with all you got. You're excited about him. You're believing God for your miracle. Someone's going to be right beside you. Someone's going to be around and tell you, give it up. They're going to be wailing and weeping and saying there's no hope. And God is speaking something to your heart and saying, don't give up. Don't quit. Keep believing. Keep Keep trusting God. In fact, they may even, as they did in this case, laugh you to scorn. They may make fun of you. They may laugh at you. But always remember, Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't listen to the crowd. Listen to the voice of Jesus. Don't be afraid, just believe. Now notice Jesus Christ does something here. What does he do? He tells those voices that are saying, it can't be done, get out of the room. What does he do? He takes three with him, Peter, James, and John. Why? Because these were the three disciples who had probably been exhibiting the most faith. And he takes the faith friends with him into the room, uh, and they begin to pray. And again, God does his miracle inside of that room and raises her up. Listen, if you're feeling ridiculed or attacked or you're in incredible warfare in this world, you need to have an inner circle of men and women who will stand by you and be men and women of faith. Now, we are in the world but not of the world. So in order to engage my world, I need to be intentional about making friends with my world. But if you also do not have an inner circle backing you up, either if you're a lady, three other ladies of faith who are standing with you, uh, who are walking with you in your spiritual journey, if you are a man, three other men who are standing with you, believing God for you, you'll get slaughtered out there in the world. We need men who will be men of faith, Ladies who will be ladies of faith. That's why men's fraternity is so important. That's why sisterhood is so important because we rally around us women of like faith or men of like faith who will stand with us. Who did Jesus take in the room? Three men full of faith. Who did he get out of the room? Get out of here. It doesn't tell how. He kicked them out. He walks into the house, takes over the house, and kicks them out of the house because he doesn't want that unbelief around when he's about to do a miracle. Wow. Hold on to the believing remnant. And then he says, little girl, arise. 
Now, what an incredible day this has been for Jairus. His, his emotions has been on a roller coaster for the last 24 hours. It starts with fear because he sees his little girl dying, uh, and, and then it moves to hope because Jesus Christ starts going along with them, and they're walking together, and then it shifts to anxiety and possibly anger. Why? Because Jesus stops to do a miracle for somebody else. Uh, then it goes to hopelessness. Because what happens, uh, his daughter dies. And then it goes to incredible joy. His faith is restored. A miracle is done. What a day. That, that, that is incredible. Now, I, I, I want you to take your notes out. I, I know I only have three points here. I want to give you three takeaways this morning for everybody in the house. I, I want to draw it together. I want to look at both stories and give you three quick takeaways. And then we're going to pray this morning. Number one. Fill your mind with the miracles of Jesus. Let me say it again. Write this down. Fill your mind with the miracles of Jesus. It says in verse 27, when she had heard about Jesus. What did she hear about? All the miracles that he had done. It doesn't say Jairus had heard, but it's obvious if he wanted to seek out Jesus Christ, he had heard as well about all the miracles Jesus Christ had done. I want to encourage you, get in the New Testament, to read the Word of God, study about Jesus Christ, get his miracles in your heart and mind, get the Word of God in your heart and mind, and it will begin to build up faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Get the miracles down. If he did it for them, he can do it for you. Second takeaway is simply this. Get rid of all hurt and bitterness. If you want freedom, if you want God's grace to move through you, if you want that miracle from God, if you want that blessing from God, he cannot do it as long as you're filled with hurt and bitterness. Unforgiveness. Can't work through you. Your vessel's clogged up. You got unforgiveness inside of you. There is a clog in your drain that will not allow the grace of God to flow through your life. It nothing poisons our spirit faster than unforgiveness. Listen to James 5:16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Now we we will read that scripture again the, the whole passage when we talk about praying for the sick. James is talking about anointing with oil, calling for the elders, pray for the sick. But he says, you won't be healed if you don't get the clog out of your arteries. If you don't get the unforgiveness out of your arteries. So if you've got aught against somebody else, you better make it right. It opens up your heart for Christ's grace to come in and heal you. Right? You can say, why won't God heal me? But you're so mad at your mom or your dad, or you're so mad at this person or that person, or you're so angry with them, or, or you're so bitter against somebody else. And as long as that bitterness consumes your heart, you cannot be a channel for God's blessing. So it says, first of all, confess your sins to one another, and then pray, and then the healing will come. I mean, comprende? You got this? If this woman... The lady with the issue of blood had held on to her hurts and all the injustices she had suffered if she had been angry and bitter and sitting in her house and pouting about how bad she had it and how mean everybody had been to her, how her husband left her, how she couldn't worship God in the temple, how she couldn't do anything else because of her infirmity, how they had accused her of having sin in her life. If she had hung on to all that anger, she had never reached out and touched the hem of his garments. Number three, step out in faith. Step out in faith. Take a risk. Take a risk. Risk misunderstanding. Risk being laughed at. Risk disappointment. Take a risk. Now turn to James chapter 5. Look at James 5 verses 14 to 16 and then we're going to pray. Is any one of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church and pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Do we believe God's word? Amen. The Lord Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Good news. Therefore, confess your sins to each other 
and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. This lady had to fight physical weakness, separation, 12 years of negative doctor's reports, not to mention pressing through a crowd that is pressing around Jesus Christ. Uh, but she sought him out. And if I can just touch the hem of his garment, she took a risk. She was unclean. What she do? Reaches out and touch that which is clean. Jairus sought out Jesus Christ and fell at his feet. I want to challenge you this morning. Step out of your comfort zone and act on faith and take a risk. Uh, press through the doubts. Press through your discouragement. Put all your disappointments from your past behind you. Uh, let it go. Persevere in faith until you hear him say, like he said to the woman, go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Or like he said, Jairus, uh, do not be afraid. Only believe. Uh, 